According to Cornell Law, a crime of passion is a crime committed in the heat of passion or in response to provocation, as opposed to a crime that was premeditated or deliberated. But at what point does passion turn into cold calculation? Hi, I'm Cam. And I'm Dev. And you're listening to Criminalish, a true crime podcast where two best friends exchange stories ranging from the wild and wacky to the downright messed up. So, Dev, today I'm going to be telling you about the story of Brooklyn Sims. Have you heard of this story before? The name Brooklyn sounds extremely familiar, but I don't think so. Just based the name only, I'm going to say no. Okay, well, you will definitely be familiar by the end of this episode. But before we get into that, what you drinking? So I am drinking a sparkling ice water, the peach lemonade flavor. Um, I am taking a little bit of a break from drinking to help with my health. So I will be drinking a lot more of these and a lot more mocktails over the next few months. And I am excited to see some fun mocktail creations from your side, Dev. I actually discovered my favorite little mocktail for the summer, which is just ginger beer and lime juice. But unfortunately, Dev does not like ginger beer, so she will not be taking that one on. Correct. I've I've tried. I've tried for like the last five years to like ginger beer because everybody's like, oh, it's so great. And I just can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> More for me. More for you and for all you ginger beer lovers in the world. But what are you drinking, Fran? I am drinking just a simple Pinot Grigio from our favorite brand, Apothic. Um, so yeah, I really just had to go to the liquor store real quick and get something for the episode. So that is what y'all have today. Yes, shout out to our favorite wine, Apothic. We love her. So before I get into today's story, I did want to extend a trigger warning for domestic violence. So if this is a sensitive topic for you, just know that our story today does deal with that. And I will do my best to not go into too many details, but I can't tell the story without mentioning those parts. So let's get into it. Like I said, today we will be talking about the life and death of Brooklyn Sims. She was born on January 25th, 2005 in Alabama. While I was not able to confirm the exact city, I believe it was near the Citronelle area. And our story today will take place between Pensacola, Florida and this area of Alabama. She also had at least one brother. And according to this brother, Brooklyn had a personality that could light up a room and make anyone laugh. Around the age of 16, we know that Brooklyn had a daughter with a man named Keith A.G. In addition to being someone with such a bright personality, Brooklyn was described as a loving mother who had big dreams not only for her, but for her daughter too. And it was unclear how long she and Keith had been dating prior to her getting pregnant, but according to friends and family, there were signs of domestic violence in their relationship. Apparently, the first time that there was an instance of domestic violence, they broke up and she took him to court. But it seems like the charges were eventually dropped and she decided to try and co-parent with Keith for their daughter's sake. May I ask a quick question? Do we know how old Keith is if Brooklyn was 16 at the time? Keith would have been 17 to 18. He was a couple years older. Okay. Um, checking in for relationship purposes. 
But also, it always upsets me when people show those abusive tendencies so young. And it just always makes me feel like, what have you seen that has made you think that this behavior is okay at this age? To be allegedly abusing your high school girlfriend at 17 is very upsetting. But please continue. We will get into it, but I can definitely say that Keith did not have the best role models growing up. Understood. We also know that in the couple of years leading up to August 2023, which is when our story takes place, Keith had been charged with two counts of domestic violence. However, these charges were dropped when the victim refused to testify. Based on the fact that Keith and Brooklyn were in an on again, off again relationship during this time. We can assume that this victim was Brooklyn, but can't know for sure because those records have not been released. Most recently, he'd been charged with domestic violence in the third degree in February 2023. And I know that people will sometimes get annoyed with the victims in these cases saying like, oh, why didn't you just testify? you know, this person hurt you so much. How come you don't want to put them in jail? And it's hard enough when you are a victim and survivor of domestic violence and you have to go and sit in front of that person in a courtroom. But it's even harder when that person is the father of your child. And I I know Brooklyn wasn't just thinking about herself in these moments. She was also thinking about her daughter. And thinking, what if I do this? What will this do to my daughter's relationship with her father? Absolutely. I think people who have that stance, I think are a have never been in that situation where they know firsthand how it feels to be abused and hurt by somebody that you love. Because I think a lot of times people, for some reason, can't grasp the fact that abuse takes place over a long period of time. That a person will build trust with you. They will love on you. They will be great to you. And then use the time that they have built in with you to justify their abuse and justify you for giving them over and over and over again. Because you rely on those good times that happened before the abuse. And I think for some reason, people just don't have the empathy or capacity to think that. Prime example, I was with an abusive ex. And when I told a former partner about that, because something he did triggered me. He told me what I should have learned from my previous relationship where I was abused was how to vet somebody so they wouldn't abuse me. That's what I should have taken away and should have learned from my relationship, not to set stronger boundaries with him because he didn't believe in me having boundaries with him, which is also textbook abusive, but a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. So I think it's important to always remember You don't know the depth of connection between the victim and the abuser or the survivor and the abuser. You just don't know. So it's not your place to give an opinion. Also, I think it's also very easy to forget that if you choose to bring these charges and testify against him, you have to be cross-examined by his attorney. He's going to cross-examine you. He's going to bring up every little facet of your life. He's going to dig into things that aren't even related to the case, but he's going to use them to show the jury how you're unreliable or you're a bad person or you shouldn't be trusted. I think people don't think about that. Like cross-examination is traumatizing if you're trying to get your story out and they have the right to do that. So why would you want somebody to come in and pick at every little vulnerability and every little thing you've ever done wrong in your life? All of those reasons are why I never judge people who don't speak up against their abusers. I understand. I hate that they feel like they don't have a voice. I hate that they feel like they can't say anything, but I will never judge them for not saying anything. Right. And I feel like every time I see someone making a judgment like that, it's someone who has never dealt with abuse. And I think that's very telling. But Brooklyn was working hard to try and create the life that she wanted for her and her daughter. She was working at Home Depot and to make things even stickier, She actually worked there with Keith's mom. Yeah. Not only is that your somewhat ex's mother, but it's the mother of your somewhat ex who was abusive to you. And your child's grandmother. Exactly. 
But it seemed like Brooklyn was at the very least trying to keep things cordial between her, Keith, Keith's family. Because we know that on August 11th, 2023, the day that this story really takes place, Sheila actually drove Brooklyn to work at the Home Depot. And around 1.30 p.m. that day, Brooklyn and her coworker were just five minutes away from being done with their shift. What they didn't know was at the same time, Keith A.G. had entered the store. He quickly made his way to the aisle that Brooklyn was on. And from the outside perspective, they exchanged a couple words and then he started shooting at Brooklyn. Her coworker, who was just a few steps away from Brooklyn, had her back turned towards Keith when he started shooting. He shot Brooklyn several times and also grazed a few employees as they were running away. Brooklyn didn't even have a chance to run. So normally I would get into the police investigation first, but I'm actually just going to back up a little bit and explain to everyone what led up to this. Earlier during the day on August 11th, Keith had received a call letting him know that he tested positive for gonorrhea. At this point, he left work, went to the home he shared with his grandma to get his gun, and drove 90 minutes to the Home Depot where Brooklyn was working. When he entered the store, he walked to where Brooklyn was to confront her about giving him an STD. But when she said, not this again, and turned away, he got mad and shot her. Keith then ran out of the store, got into his car, and drove away. I'm going to pause because Devin is giving me the most confused face I've ever seen her make. My main thought right now is that Keith is a coward. Keith is pathetic. And Keith is a horrible human being. Because I'm sorry. And maybe I just feel this way because I'm an adult and I'm grown. Baby, gonorrhea is curable. You're allegedly doing all of this over gonorrhea? Somebody that you can take a pill for a couple of days or whatever? I don't even know. But I do know it's treatable. Right. It's not something that you're going to carry around for the rest of your life. And that is enough for you to shoot and kill this woman? You're pathetic. Utterly pathetic. And I try to give a lot of grace on this podcast. I try not to have too strong of feelings on this podcast. For real, for real. But Keith, you're pathetic. And I stand 10 toes down on that. Agreed. Because just a little bit after shooting Brooklyn, Keith called the police on himself and he was arrested in the parking lot of a movie theater. He told the operator that he, quote, was trying to turn himself in because he made a mistake. End quote. All of that for what? You know what a mistake is, friend? A mistake is I got turkey bacon instead of pig bacon. It's not a mistake for me. (laughs) A mistake is, damn, I dropped my coffee mug. A mistake is something that I had no intentions of doing wrongfully. You do not get to say that you made a mistake when you made the decision to go to your house, get your gun, drive 90 minutes to where she worked, which sounds to me like you had approximately two hours, if we include the drive from the clinic back to his grandma's house, to not make said mistake. Sounds like you had a lot of time to not make said mistake. Mistakes are not intentional. Agreed. At this point, he was arrested and charged with first-degree murder for the murder of Brooklyn, as well as one count of aggravated battery due to the harm he caused to her co-workers. In his police interview, Keith explained that he'd been in an on-again, off-again relationship with Brooklyn, and he even admitted to police that she had a protective order against him, but they kept in contact so that he could see his child. You do not deserve this woman. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that just angered me. You do not deserve this woman. You have put her through hell in the short time you have known her. And she still doesn't refuse you the ability to see your child. That is a stand up woman right there. 
because I don't know if I would be able to do the same thing. Wow. He also recounted the events of that morning, the same events that I mentioned to you earlier, and explained to police what led up to him murdering Brooklyn in cold blood. He even told them that on this hour and a half long drive from Calvert, Alabama to Pensacola, Florida, he would pulled over nearly an hour in and contemplated continuing on. He had a chance to turn around, to forget it, to still be angry, but to not do something irreversible. I'm glad you said that, friend, though, because that very clearly confirms first degree. Because you thought about it, you thought about changing your mind, and then you committed and decided to do what you were going to do. That's first degree right there. Right. And in just another testament to his cowardice, he also said that he'd thrown the murder weapon out the window after fleeing the scene. Of course. Of course. And it's like, so you do all this, you, you drive an hour and a half, pull over an hour in, still decide to continue on going. Then you murder someone. And now suddenly you're so scared. Now, suddenly you're full of regret. Where was the regret before you took her life? Exactly, friend. Exactly. And this is the thing that pisses me off all the time is abusers. Abusers love to pretend to be victims. Abusers love to try to turn the tables and make their actions against you seem like, oh, but this made me feel so bad. And I felt so bad. And now I'm scared because I made the decision to drive an hour and a half to murder an innocent woman at work. Don't you feel bad for me? It's insanity. I will say it's the oldest play in the abuser handbook. But it still shocks me every time I hear it. Exactly. But. Luckily, this allowed investigators to put another nail in Keith's coffin because they were able to retrieve the murder weapon once he told them what he'd done with it. Good. As investigators are reviewing the evidence, they realize that Keith didn't necessarily act alone in this. And on August 14th, 2023, Sheila, Keith's mother, was arrested and charged with principal to first degree murder. You're lying to me, Cam. I wish I were. Oh, oh my God. Luckily for you lovely folks listening at home, I had to cut out the last two minutes of silence I needed in order to process what Cam just told me. But that is the craziest thing I've ever seen. You're telling me that after everything your son has done, you side with him and help him? commit a murder when this woman is still allowing him and you access to the child this little girl did nothing to you at your big age i'm so mad i'm so mad i have so i am so mad i have so many thoughts i have so many feelings i just need to keep i'm gonna write them down and hopefully mm -hmm. by the end of this i'll be able to make a a cohesive statement about how i feel but please know right now in this moment, it is rage. Rage is what I feel. <laughs> and to make matters worse, Sheila had apparently been at a balloon release event with Brooklyn's loved ones right before her arrest. Oh, you're. So we know the cause of everything. Mom is the root of all evil. That's what I just put together. Mom is the root mm -hmm. of all evil. That is some psychopathic <laughs> That's crazy. I hate that. I hate everything about that. And I'm not even done yet, honestly. Um, in the arrest report, investigators stated that Sheila played a, quote, major role, end quote, in Brooklyn's murder. But what evidence was driving this belief? Text messages between Sheila and her son, Keith. So, Dev, I'm, I'm about to send you some text messages, and we're just going to read these out for our listeners and viewers. These were the text messages that were exchanged between Keith and Sheila in the hours before Brooklyn's murder. I'm going to throw up. Yeah. 
I'm actually gonna throw up. Are you good? You wanna take a break? No, I'm okay. I'm just. She's a baby. Literally, eighteen years old. She's a baby with a baby. A baby with a baby whose life was taken. How do you do that to her? Okay, so Devin, I'm going to read the text messages from Keith and you read them from Sheila. Okay, friend. She ain't do nothing but cost me money and gave me something. I'm finna just shoot her. I know. I hate that for our daughter. But like I said, I can't take it. I don't give a fuck no more. Okay. Okay. I'll call you and tell you, motherfucker. If you want to go to jail, I'll tell you when we get close. But if you don't, come kill her, you a motherfucking bitch. Don't call Nanny and tell her she will try and talk you out of it. I ain't even gonna tell her why I left. I'ma just say I gotta go to the dentist. Don't even go there. She won't know you left. Don't shoot at my motherfucking car. I don't wanna die. I'm not. Wait till I put her out. I was gonna wait till she got out. Okay. But that's another thing. If she don't get out that car, mama, and I have to drag her out or can't, I'm going to ask you to step out because I'm going to open the door and just shoot her. As long as you don't shoot me. Hell, if you get off work now, I'll give you the address here and you can drive over here and do it so you don't have to do it in front of your daughter. Send it to me. We just in Pensacola. I'm on the way. Send it. Hold up. Let me get it. Erase the text because I don't want nobody to know I was texting your stupid ass. I already deleted mine. Trust me. I ain't gonna say shit about us even talking today. What's the address? I can't wait to get back to that store to give you the address because you're gonna have to shoot me today. I done told you about cussing me. All I want is that address, mama. I'm done talking. I done talked enough. I know what's gonna happen and I'm okay with that. I done already been thinking it through and this is the only way for me. I don't know why you're so quick to start shit with me, but again, must be scared of Brooklyn or something. I don't know. She gonna be on the floor, right? Waiting on you. I'm saying I'm gonna have to find her in the back or something? Nope. Okay. Stay out my way. I am. LOL, man, get off my phone. All I needed was that address. Leave me alone, finish your work day. And you is to I forgot just me. So that last thought of her knowing she's fucked and the regret in her face will be enough to satisfy me. I don't give a fuck what she see when she's dead. Yes, the fuck she do. How the fuck I'm picking her up when your sorry ass trying to go gamble or hang in Jackson and she don't pick up the phone? Nah, that ain't gonna fly. She had just died before I let that continue. Okay, whatever. I don't care. Do whatever you do. I don't give a fuck. Because I'm going home today. To hell or to jail. Good for you. Okay, then stop texting me. I'm working. Do whatever you want to do. It don't affect me either fucking way. Yep. You texted all of this to your 20 year old son about his 18 year old girlfriend, who is also the mother of his child, who has never withheld his child from him, who has allegedly recounted and refused to testify against him. So he didn't go to jail. This is what you do. You plan a murder. You encourage him. You call him a if he doesn't kill her. You're just as big of a bitch as he is. And for them to acknowledge through text messages that they're about to fuck up their daughter's life, that they're about to fuck up his life, her life, the family's lives, and them to just not care is insanity to me. That's disgusting. And for him to say, I've thought this through and this is the only way. You are his mother. This should be the time that you step in and you say, son. This is not the right way. We can figure something out. I understand you're angry. I understand you're hurt, but this is not the right way. For you to tell him not to tell his grandmother because she's just going to stop him. She's going to be the mother that you should have been. I mean, but don't get it twisted. I did peep that he lived at his grandmother's house and not at his mother's. So I think that also tells me a lot about their situation. Right. So based on these text messages, investigators believe the original plan was for Keith to actually shoot Brooklyn right when she was getting out of Sheila's car. And for whatever reason, this didn't pan out, but investigators believe that Sheila had communicated Brooklyn's location to Keith prior to him entering the store. 
Other co-workers at Home Depot reported that she was acting strangely that day. And investigators also found that she texted Keith a map of the store. This woman will spend an eternity in hell. I can't believe that because I just can't get over. I don't know how old his mama is. Quite frankly, I don't care. At your big age, however big of an age it is, you have this much hatred in your spirit and heart for an 18 year old little girl. For an 18 year old who was, again, the mother of your grandchild. Is the sole reason why your son isn't in jail. Right. So now let's get on to the trial. From what I could tell in my research, Keith's trial began December 18th, 2023, and only lasted a couple of days. Keith pled not guilty to the charge of first-degree murder, claiming that this murder was not premeditated. During this trial, the jury heard his 911 call, saw a video of his arrest, and also heard testimony from experts as well as other evidence including the text messages between him and his mother. Sheila was also apparently a witness during this trial, but I could not find anything from her testimony, likely because she still has to face trial herself. Does she know how stupid that is? Does she know that your statements that you made in court can be used against you in your own trial? I have no idea what she knows other than how to not be a mother. And on that, we can agree. The prosecution argued that Keith was on a mission to kill Brooklyn, while the defense argued that the murder was not premeditated and emphasized that the burden of proof was on prosecution. (laughs) That's the defense you give when you got nothing. (laughs) Exactly. When it's so obvious your client did it, that's the that's the defense. The prosecution has to has the burden. The prosecution has to prove it. That's called for we got nothing and he did it. And I guess they were just grasping at straws and trying anything because Keith actually testified at his own trial in order to argue that the murder was not premeditated. He claimed that the moment of passion was when Brooklyn said, not this again, and turned her back on him. He claimed that he would not have shot at Brooklyn if she hadn't turned her back. So you're telling me that the only reason you weren't going to shoot her is you couldn't look her in the face as you did it. Sounds pretty cowardly to me. He tried to tell the jury that in the moment when he saw her face, All of his rage had melted, but it bubbled back again when she turned her back on him. And to let you know how well that argument worked, on December 20th, 2023, Keith was found guilty of first degree premeditated murder after the jury deliberated for three hours. Period. Which is, I think, just long enough for them to have gone through all the evidence again, said, yeah, this is enough time for them to think that, you know, we, we, listen to both sides, and come back out. Factual. Factual. He was sentenced to life without parole and was acquitted on the aggravated battery charge due to a lack of evidence. Not really sure what evidence was lacking, but they probably were just trying to focus on that first degree murder charge. Okay, I'll be generous. He's going to die in prison, so that's fine. Yeah. And to just tie this up, with a nice little bow. At the end of the trial, the prosecutor submitted a final piece of evidence to the court that showed Brooklyn did not have an STD. So you knew you were out here. Ooh, ooh, I gotta say it this way, I'll fix it later. So you knew you was out here f-ing around. You knew you was out here f-ing around. What's a better way to say that? <laughs> it's no better way. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're not wrong you're not wrong <laughs> and keith had testified that he hadn't slept with anyone in the past couple weeks but even if that were true i think people need to keep in mind that for most stds men are usually asymptomatic 
So just because he didn't start seeing those signs until that time period doesn't mean that he had just gotten gonorrhea. Exactly. Because you said you hadn't slept with anybody else in the last few weeks. Not, I ain't never slept with nobody else. Not, I hadn't slept with anyone else from the last time I got tested. Hello. Hello. I hope you and your mother feel extra stupid and extra guilty about what you did because because your apparent whole reason for taking your child's mother away from them was over an STD that she didn't even have. So I'm just going to share a few excerpts from people's statements during the trial and sentencing. The judge addressed the court and said, quote, This was the textbook definition of premeditated murder. Because you got mad and blamed her for something in disgusting irony that wasn't even her fault. And if you had taken any time to think about it, you would have found that out. End quote. The judge is spitting. Throw that book at him. Throw the Mm -hmm. book at him. Keith also addressed the court and said, quote, I would like to apologize to the family. I can't ask for forgiveness. I can't ask not to hate me. I just want her mother to know that through our past relationship and things that have happened, I'm grateful to have had Brooklyn in my life. The thing she has done for me has not went without consideration in my heart. I think about Brooklyn every night. Every night before I go to sleep, I pray for our daughter in Brooklyn. Regret is an understatement. If I can reverse the roles, I would take Brooklyn's place. I have to live with this decision for the rest of my life, and I have accepted that. I just hate the fact her family has to go through this. End quote. Not the fact that you put them through this, but that they have to go through this. And that's exactly what I was about to call out, because there's no accountability in that statement. It's very much, I'm sorry you feel that way. Right. And I actually do think that Keith feels regret. I do think that Keith wishes that he hadn't done this. We could even see on the drive up there, he'd stopped and was considering it. But his mother was texting him saying, you're weak if you don't go through with this. You're not a man if you don't go through with this. Imagine if he would had someone who was actually encouraging him to make the right decision. You know what? I can talk to her. Let let me call you and talk to you. Talk you off of this ledge. It's not worth it. Think about your daughter. Think about your life. But no, he had the opposite. He had the devil on his shoulder, egging him on. Perfectly said Cam. Because that's exactly what his mother was in this case. And the last excerpt that I want to share is from Brooklyn's mother, Cornelia. She said, quote, August 11th changed my life. I lost my daughter. Her siblings lost a sister. She was an auntie. She was a friend. She was an amazing child. She didn't deserve this. I don't hate Mr. A.G., but I can't forgive him. I'm raising his daughter. That day, Brooklyn's daughter lost a mother, a father, and a grandmother. End quote. That's a beautiful statement. I have so much respect for the fact that she will not allow him to occupy space in her heart to hate him, to wish ill on him. And I know a lot of people have this whole thing of like, oh, forgiveness is not for that other person. Forgiveness is for you. Everybody doesn't need to be forgiven. I can move on with my life. I can be happy. I can be healthy. I can be doing well mentally, emotionally, and physically and still not forgive somebody from my past because they have just done something so vile that it cannot be let go. And this is the prime example of something that is so vile that cannot be let go. And I know I mentioned that Sheila had been arrested shortly after attending a balloon release event on August 14th, 2023, but I don't want to let that overshadow 
all of the love and support that was coming from Brooklyn's loved ones that day. And I just want to share one more quote that I think not only encapsulates Brooklyn, but also the love that people had for her. During that balloon release event, her brother said, quote, I feel like I let my little sister down. Like I couldn't protect my sister. It's crazy because tomorrow's my birthday. It's a lot to deal with. End quote. And he also said that he felt like Brooklyn's spirit was living on through her daughter. When her daughter would smile, he would see Brooklyn smile in her. When she would laugh, he would hear Brooklyn's laugh. Brooklyn's funeral was held from August 25th to August 26, 2023 in Citronelle, Alabama. Sheila Agee's trial was supposed to be held in February 2024, but it must have been postponed. I was unable to find any more recent information past December of 2023 about her trial or any updates related to them. And that is the end of our story. I'm going to start more positively before I get into anger. I so appreciate you telling this story, Cam, because I feel like a lot of times we don't talk about domestic violence as seriously when couples are young when they're teenagers we try to make it like it's just some kind of teenage spat we don't take it as seriously as we should and I appreciate you bringing forth a case that highlights how dangerous domestic violence is at every level and you did such a great job telling the story thank you I'm not gonna lie though that last line hit me in my my feels a little bit harder than I was expecting because grief is a crazy thing. There is literally nothing her brother could have done. And for him to carry this weight of feeling some kind of responsibility in this, that really broke my heart and tells me everything I need to know about him as an older brother, as an uncle, as a person because I do know that he will be there for her daughter and I hate that he has to carry this weight on him it's not fair the whole family has to carry the weight and it's not fair but just going to speak on his statement that really really broke my heart but that tells me that that is an incredible young man yeah And I think the point about, you know, it being his birthday just a few days after his sister was murdered, that's another thing about grief is it doesn't feel right to feel happy. It doesn't feel right to be laughing when you know that someone you love has gone through something so horrible. So I can only imagine the guilt, not only the guilt that he's still feeling, but the guilt that he especially felt in those days after her murder. Absolutely. I hate everything about this case. Very rarely has a case just made me so sad that I want to cry. And this one has done it for me because again, you killed a baby with a baby. You have a woman encouraging her son to ruin his whole life, ruin his child's life, ruin Brooklyn's life, ruin Brooklyn's family's life. And it's so obvious that she thought there would be no repercussions whatsoever. She thought that she was going to delete those little text messages off her phone and she was going to act like that never happened and move on with her life. And that's so scary to me. Right. It's even scarier that she was able to go to this event where all of Brooklyn's loved ones were crying and expressing their sorrow and grief, knowing that she played a direct part in Brooklyn's murder. She was able to stand there and pretend to grieve with them. Exactly. Because it's barely appropriate that you're there at all. I'm going to be real about that. It's barely appropriate that you're there because your son did this. And they allowed you to be there. They allowed you to be there to grieve with the family 
you probably got to hold Brooklyn's daughter, give her a hug, something that she will never get to do again. Knowing that you encouraged your son to kill an innocent child. You're insane. You're actually insane. And I worry about the kind of people who are capable of doing that. I do hope that she goes to trial. I do hope that she gets a sentence just as long as her son. Because you're an accomplice, in my opinion, because you helped plan the murder. You facilitated the first degree of the first degree murder. So to me, you need to go sit in a cell for the rest of your life. Exactly. You encouraged him to murder her. You told him, don't tell your grandmother because she's just going to talk you out of it. Because grandma's the only one who has some sense here. Right. You let him know where she was going to be. Because in a way, really, you set her up. Exactly. You were planning to have her killed right in front of your eyes, right outside of your car. Honestly, I didn't put that together until you said the previous statement. You're correct. This was a whole setup. Right. And then what was going to happen? Were you then going to help your son hide her body? Were you then going to deny the family the ability to give her a proper funeral and a burial? What was the plan after that? Because the text messages are bad enough, but we have no idea what was said over this phone call that allegedly happened. That's insane. That's insane. That's scary. That's horrible. I hate everything about that. And I wish both of these people to spend the rest of their lives in jail. Exactly. Because you've ruined your son's life too. You encouraged him to do, even if he had gotten away with it, killing somebody is his own life sentence, if you're any type of sane. Hello. The fact that he, even if he'd gotten away with it, even in the best case scenario, he would have still held that on him. He would have still held that with him. And I believe had his mother not gotten involved, this would not have happened. I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. Because again, and this is the disgusting part, you hit him in his manhood. You told him that he's a b if he doesn't go and kill his girlfriend who didn't even give them this STD. Yeah, and that's probably not the first time she's done that. Exactly. That's exactly what I was about to say. She was way too comfortable calling him a <laughs> coming after his manhood, telling him he's not a man if he doesn't do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. She was way too comfortable doing that. And that tells me, and again, he doesn't even live with you. So that tells me everything I need to know about you as a mother. Any other thoughts, friend? Sadness. But that's all I've got, friend. Thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode. I would especially like to thank WEAR-TV, which is a Pensacola news station, and Court TV for providing much of the material for this episode. If you would like to check out photos related to this case, we'll be posting them on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Criminalish Podcast. Listeners, if you like what you hear, be sure to tell a friend and leave us a five-star review wherever you're listening to the Criminalish podcast. And if you're listening on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe to our channel and feel free to leave any comments or questions. As always, stay nosy, my friends. Bye. Bye.